All right, hello everyone, and welcome to my channel. Uh, this is an educational channel. We like to take a look at great theories of everything, all-encompassing theories, uh, grand unified theories, and really anything cosmologies, anything that purports to address every question and. Today is our 563rd video that we've done on the reciprocal system of theory from Dewey B. Larson and um, his associates. And uh, Mr. Larson was an American engineer who lived from 1898 until 1990 and uh, left behind a lot of books on uh, physics and chemistry and astronomy. But he's also got a book on metaphysics uh, with sections on religion and philosophy, psychology, biology. Uh, his associates have uh, contributed things on meteorology, geology, crypto, archaeology, conspiracy theories, and um, Larson has two books on economics, and we're looking at one of those books today. It's called The Road to Permanent Prosperity. We're in chapter 18 of that book on um, wartime, the wartime economy, and uh, we'll start that up in a second, but let me just uh, let you know that the reciprocal system of theory is uh, a theory uh, where... Larson was one of the few scientists to propose a cosmology based upon motion, uh, not matter or energy or anything else. So in Larson's universe, the universe is made out of motion. Larson's first postulate that he released in 1959 states that the universe is composed entirely of one component, motion existing in three dimensions in discrete units and with two reciprocal aspects, space and time. Okay, so in Larson's universe, the universe is made out of motion, and motion is the relationship between space and time. They have a reciprocal relationship. All of our scientific entities, like matter and force and uh, acceleration and momentum and pressure and power. These are all fractions with space or time as the numerator and time or space as the denominator. Uh, space and time can have multiple exponents. So you can have power is one over space. Pressure is time over space to the fourth power. Matter is time to the third power over space to the third power. And uh, on and on like that. Uh, now, another thing to mention about motion is Larson is thinking about motion in kind of its most generic terms, or he's referring to what he calls scalar motion. Scalar motion is a motion that has a magnitude, but it has no specific direction. A scalar motion is kind of like a an internal motion or an inherent motion. Uh, it's uh, not the motion of things between uh, space, but it is a motion of time and space. So the motion is kind of coming from the inside. You can envision a scalar motion if you take a balloon and you put dots on it with a magic marker. Uh, as you blow up the balloon, all of the dots will be moving away from one another. Uh, every dot will be moving away from every other dot. But they're not moving in any specific direction. Really, every dot is moving in every direction, outward. The only direction that you can impute to it is outward, out or in, if you contract the balloon. 
Those are the two major kinds of uh, motion in Larson's system. The first is called the progression, the outward motion, and the inward motion is likened to gravitation. Um, and um, Larson then applies many of these um, principles to economic theory. And uh, he tries to dispense with the sociological schools of economics, who try to put their political spin or their ideological spin onto economics and says that econ economics is, an, uh, is a science. You have to construct your economic system based upon facts. And um, if you don't do that, it will collapse, just like if you were building a bridge or house. And um, then after that, you can start to impose your ideological, uh, you know, viewpoints on it. Larson believed that the economic system was one of motion, dynamic, and that uh, the two reciprocal aspects in his study are production and consumption. And they are both... Uh, you know, of the same goods. You produce goods, they become purchasing power for the producer, for the consumer, they become articles of consumption. And Larson uh, arrives at a number of basic uh, uh, principles that uh, are kind of like aphorisms. Um, that he bases uh, 17 different principles uh, that he derives that are mathematically exact that he uh, places onto the economy. He also uh, draws up a flowchart, uh, which is uh, hopefully on the thumbnail here, that you can see uh, the progress of the economic system. There's really two flows, uh, a purchasing power flow and a goods flow. One of them is circular, one of them is uh, unidirectional. Okay, um, now we'll, we're going to get into chapter 18 here, starting from maybe about a third of the way through on wartime economy. A little reflection on the financial predicaments in which, uh, let me stop just for a second here. Uh, if you'd like to get any more information about the reciprocal system, uh, just watch any of my first or many of my first 474 videos on the subject. Um, I go into it a little bit deeper, explain the postulates and so on. Um, and also, if you want to start this book from the, from the jump, uh, chapter one, uh, go back about six weeks in the library and uh, you can start fresh from the top. But here we are in chapter 18. Uh, you may be able to wing it and just listen from here and understand uh, enough for this episode. But if you do get confused, you might want to go back toward the beginning. A little reflection on the financial predicaments in which so many foreign governments now find themselves should be sufficient to demonstrate how ridiculous that viewpoint which regards government bonds as liquid assets, actually is. These governments are not lacking in printing presses, and if they could create assets simply by putting those presses to work, there would be no problems. But all the printing that they can do, whether it be printing bonds or printing money, does not change the economic situation of these nations in the least. Their real income is still measured by their production, nothing else. And their problems result from the fact that this production does not keep pace with their aspirations. The spending enthusiasts assure us that government debt is of no consequence, that we merely owe it to ourselves. But this is loose and dangerous reasoning. It is true that where the debt is held domestically, the net balance from the standpoint of the nation as a whole is zero. But this means that we are 
that we now have nothing, whereas before the deficit spending was undertaken, we had something real. What has happened is that under cover of this specious doctrine, the government has spent our real assets and has replaced them with pieces of paper. Government borrowing differs greatly from dealings between individuals. When we borrow from each other, the total amount of available money purchasing power is not altered in any way. That is, there is no reservoir transaction. All that has taken place is a transfer from one individual to another. No one has increased or decreased his assets by this process. The lender has parted with his money, but he now has some evidence of the loan to take its place. And the net assets shown on his balance sheet remain unchanged in amount. The borrower now has the money, but his books must indicate the debt as a liability. The borrowing done by the government is not a balanced transaction of this kind. It is a one-sided arrangement in which the participation of the government conceals the true situation on the debit side of the ledger. The net position of the lender appears to be the same as in the case of private credit dealings. His cash on hand has decreased, but he has bonds to take the place of the money. However, as a taxpayer, he now owes a proportionate share, not only of the bonds that he holds, but also all other bonds that the government has issued. Any family that has laid away $100,000 in bonds believes that they can that they have saved a thousand dollars in bonds, a thousand dollars, which will be available for buying goods when they wish to spend the money. But while these things, while these savings were being accomplished, the government, on behalf of the citizens, built up a debt of two thousand dollars per capita. A family of four which has saved only two thousand dollars um, which has saved only one thousand dollars has in reality gone um, says seven thousand dollars into the red I think it just means one thousand dollars into the red the debt will probably be passed on to their heirs but in the long run someone will have to pay it one way or the other the savings made during a period of heavy government borrowing are fictitious, and they cannot be used unless someone gives up real values to make them good. Either these real values must be taken from the public through the process of taxation, or those who work and earn must share their earnings with the owners of the fictitious values through the process of money inflation. Government borrowing provides the ideal vehicle for those who wish to spend the taxpayer's money without the victims realizing what is going on. Another absurd idea that is widely accepted is that the shortages of goods, such as those which are caused by the curtailment of production during a major war, constitute a favorable economic factor when the war is over and productive facilities are again available for civilian goods. Much stress was laid on the deferred demand for goods that was built up during World War II, and in the strange upside-down economic thinking of modern times, this was looked upon as a favorable factor, one of the major ingredients of prosperity, as the National Association of Manufacturers characterized it. But the truth is that the deferred demand was simply a measure of the deterioration that had taken place in the material wealth of the nation. There was a deferred demand for automobiles only because our cars had worn out and we were too busy with war production to replace them. If this is an ingredient of prosperity, then the atomic bombs are capable of administering prosperity in colossal doses. But such contentions are preposterous. 
We cannot dodge the fact that accumulated wealth always suffers a serious loss during a major war, and the deferred demand is a reflection of that loss, not an asset. While real wealth decreases during the conflict, the government conceals the true situation by creating a fictitious wealth that the individual citizens are unable, for the time being, to distinguish from the real thing. Instead of the automobile, which is now worn out and ready for the junk pile, Joe Dokes now possesses war bonds, which to him represent the same amount of value and with which he expects to be able to buy a new car when the proper time arrives. But the value that he attributes to the bonds is only an illusion a bit of financial trickery, but, and in reality, Joe will have to pay for his car in taxes or by an inflationary decrease in his purchasing power. Not only was enough of this false wealth created to mask the loss in real wealth during the war, but it was manufactured in quantities sufficient to make high wage scales and extraordinary profits possible while the true economic position of the nation as a whole was growing steadily worse. The extent to which superficial observers were deceived by the financial sleight of hand performance is well illustrated in this statement by Stuart Chase. Quote, After Pearl Harbor, money came rolling in by the tens of billions, enough of it not only to pay for the war, but to keep the standard of living at par. Both guns and butter were financed, end quote. Perhaps such illusions can be maintained permanently in the minds of some individuals. Chase, Chase published these words in 1964, apparently unimpressed by the fact that his dollar was worth less than half of its 1941 value, or by the further fact that nearly $200 billion of the money that came rolling in during the war was still hanging over the heads of the taxpayers in the form of outstanding government bonds. Whether all members of the general public realize it or not, the taxpayers ultimately have to pay all of the costs of a war. The holders of government bonds are not satisfied to hoard their bonds as the miser does his gold prices. They all expect to exchange them for goods sooner or later. Then Joe Dokes must be taxed, either directly through the tax collector or indirectly through inflation. Financial juggling may postpone the day of reckoning, but that day always arrives. Clear-thinking observers realize that huge individual holdings of readily negotiable government bonds constitutes a serious menace to the national economy, not a source of economic strength. Even before the end of World War II, the, the analysts of the Department of Commerce were beginning to worry about the financial future. Here is their 1944 estimate of the situation. Quote, While the government encountered no major difficulties in raising money needed, for the largest military program in history, it left the people with a tremendous fund of liquid assets. Part of this fund is sufficiently volatile to be a distinct inflationary threat at the moment. It may constitute a problem of major magnitude in the immediate post-war period. End quote. Now let us turn back to the principles developed in the earlier chapters and see just why large bond and currency holdings are dangerous, why they constitute a problem of major magnitude. On analysis of the market relations, it was found that the essential requirement for economic stability is a purchasing power equilibrium, a condition in which the purchasing power reaches the markets uh, the purchasing power reaching the markets is the same as that created by current production. It was further determined 
that the factor which destroys this balance and causes economic disturbances is the presence of money and credit reservoirs, which absorb and release money purchasing power in various quantities so that the equilibrium between production and the markets that would otherwise exist is upset first in one direction and then in the other. Naturally, the farther these reservoirs depart from their normal levels, the greater the potential for causing trouble. And the outstanding feature of the immediate post-war situation was that the money and credit reservoirs were filled to a level never before approached. Except when it serves to counterbalance an actual deflationary shortage of money purchasing power, money released from the reservoirs can do no good. It cannot be used for additional purchases. There is no way of producing additional goods for sale without at the same time and by the same act producing more purchasing power. No matter how much we may expand production, the act of production creates all of the purchasing, po purchasing power that is needed to buy the goods that are produced. So the money released from the reservoirs can do nothing but raise prices. Instead of being a reserve of liquid assets as seen by the general public and by the Keynesians like Alvin Hansen, the government bonds in the hands of individuals at the end of the war constituted an enormous load of debt. The financial juggling that misled the public and many of the experts as well into believing that the nation had accumulated a big backlog of assets merely made the adjustment to reality more difficult than it otherwise would have been. One of the most distressing features of the post-World War II situation is that the policies which brought it about, the policies that led to a severe inflation that conferred great prosperity on favored individuals while their share of the war burden was shifted to others, that left us with a post-war legacy of debt and other financial problems, were adopted deliberately and with a reasonably complete knowledge of the consequences that would ensue. H.G. Moulton gives us this report. Quote, Shortly after the United States entered the war, a memorandum on methods of financing the war, subscribed to by a large number of professional economists, was submitted to the government. In brief, it was contended that stability of prices could be maintained if proper methods of financing were employed. It was held that if all the money required by the government were raised by taxes on income or from the sale of bonds to individuals who pay for them out of savings, there would be no increase in the supply of money as compared with the supply of goods, and hence no rise in the price level. On the other hand, to the extent that the Treasury borrowed the money required, either from the banks or from individuals who borrow in order to invest in government securities, the resulting increase in the supply of money would inevitably produce a general rise in prices. End quote. This statement is inaccurate in some respects. It attributes the inflationary price rise to an increase in the supply of money rather than to the true cause, an increase in the money purchasing power available for use in the markets. And it fails to recognize that cost inflation due to wage increases and higher business taxes would raise prices to some extent, even if the money inflation were avoided. But essentially, it was a sound recommendation and if it had been adopted, the post-war inflation problems would have been much, much less serious. However, as Moulton says, quote, the policy pursued by the government was in fact quite the opposite. It is quite understandable that a government which rests on a shaky base and is doubtful as to the degree of support it would receive from the people of the nation in case 
the true costs of war were openly revealed, should resort to all manner of expedients to conceal the facts and to avoid facing unpleasant reality. Even though it is evident that this will merely compound the problems in the long run, perhaps there are these there are those who are similarly uneasy about the willingness to be uh, the willingness of the American public to stand behind an all out military effort if they are told the truth about what it will cost. But the record certainly does not justify such doubts. Past experience indicates that they are willing to pay the bill if they concur in the objective. It is true that, as J.M. Clark put it, there is a tendency toward, quote, an uncompromising determination on the part of powerful groups that whoever has to endure a shrunken real income, it won't be us. But such intransigent attitudes are primarily results of the policies that were adopted in fear of them. The worker who sees the extravagant manner in which the war spending is carried on, the apparently boundless profits of war-connected businesses, business enterprises, and the general air of war prosperity can hardly be criticized if he, too, wants his take-home pay maintained at a high level. But if the government is willing to face realities and, instead of creating a false front by financial manipulation, carries out a sound and realistic economy, uh, economic policy that does not conceal the true conditions, one that makes it clear to all that wartime is a time of sacrifice and will require sacrifices of everyone, there is good reason to believe that most members of the general public including the industrial workers, would take up their respective burdens without demur. The first requirement of a realistic wartime economic policy is sound finance. As pointed out earlier in the discussion, the general standard of living must drop when a major portion of a nation's productive facilities is diverted from the production of civilian goods to war production and the straightforward way of handling this decrease that must take place in any event is by taxation. However, taxes are always unpopular, and since governments are prone to take the path of least resistance, the general tendency is to call upon other expedients as far as possible and to keep taxes unrealistically low. But this attempt to avoid facing the facts is the very thing that creates most of the wartime and post-war economic problems. The only sound policy is to set taxes high enough to at least take care of that portion of the cost of the war that has to be met from income. The major source, the other major source from which the sinews of war can be obtained is the utilization of tangible wealth already in existence either directly or indirectly, by not replacing items worn out in service, thus freeing labor for war production. There are some valid arguments for handling this portion of the cost of the war by means of loans rather than taxes, but in order to keep on a sound economic basis, any such borrowing should be done from individuals, not from the banking system. The objective of these policies of heavy taxation and non-inflationary borrowing is to reduce the consumer's disposable income by the same amount that the government is spending, thus avoiding money inflation. Some cost of inflation may and probably will occur, as there will undoubtedly be some upward readjustment of wages to divert labor into war production, but this should not introduce any serious problems. Prevention of money inflation will automatically eliminate the easy profit situation in civilian business. Profits will remain at normal levels, but they will remain normal only for those who keep their enterprises operating efficiently. They will not come without effort, as in the case 
when money inflation is underway. There will no doubt continue to be a great deal of waste and inefficiency in the direct war production industries, as it is hard to keep an eye on efficiency when the urgency of the needs is paramount. But, on the whole, this kind of a sound financial program will not only apportion the war burden more equitably, but will also contribute materially toward lightening that burden since it will eliminate much of the inefficiency that inevitably results when there is no penalty for inefficient operation. A sound and realistic program of financing the war effort will have the important additional advantage of avoiding public pressure for price control measures. If the price level stays constant in wartime, it is clear to the individual consumer that his inability to obtain all of the goods necessary to maintain his pre-war standard of living is due to the heavy taxation necessitated by the military requirements. He can see that he is merely carrying a share of the war burden. But when his take-home pay, the balance after payroll taxes and other deductions, is as large as ever, perhaps even larger than before the war, and he has been led to believe that the cost of the war is being met by the expansion of the nation's productive facilities, that the management of the war effort by the administration in power is so efficient that the economy can produce both guns and butter, then the inability of um, the inability to maintain his pre-war standard of living is, in his estimation, cha chargeable to inflated prices. This price rise is not anything that he associates with the conduct of the war. To him, it is caused by the activities of speculators, profiteers, and the other popular whipping boys of the economic scene, and he wants something done about it. The usual government answer is some action toward price control, often only a gesture, sometimes a sincere and well-intentioned effort. Okay, um, I think we're going to stop right there for today, and um, hopefully we'll be able to finish this chapter tomorrow on wartime economics and move on. Uh, so thank you for tuning in today. And um, have a great day.